Welcome back, everybody. Joe Everest, the fence expert. If you guys remember, we did a three-part series where I reacted to April Wilkerson's fence build. Well, she's built another fence. This one, though, looks like she built from the ground up. She built it from scratch. If you remember the last video, she had existing posts. She modified those posts to be taller, and then she ended up having to do post surrounds. Well, this time, she's building a whole new fence, and I can't wait to watch it. In this video, I'm gonna get started on building a horizontal board on board fence here in my new commercial space, the woodshed. I actually broke this video into two parts because there's so much information to deliver. So if a fence is on your to-do list, and I hope that this helps you out, let's get going. Actually, before I get started on the process, let me show you the ending results. So you have an image in your head on what I'm going for as you follow along in the process. Total, the fence is 196 feet long and ended up being eight feet high. On my last board and board fence, I kept my existing post and just extended them to the height needed. However, since I'm going with a horizontal fence, I will need a post every six feet, which is the length of the pickets I bought. That meant I wasn't able to reuse the existing post. You know, I'll add one thing. So she mentioned she's doing six foot because she's building a horizontal fence. Typically, anything over six feet tall, even if it's a vertical privacy fence, we'd still do posts at six foot spacings to try to give it more structural support. So this project started by ripping out the existing fence and post, then digging out for the new post hole locations. Once the holes were dug, it was time to start setting posts. For this entire build, I am using Western Red Cedar. I absolutely love the look of Western Red Cedar. It not only has such a beautiful, rich coloring to it, but it's also naturally rot and weather resistant, making it one of my top picks for any project going outdoors. However, you are not supposed to put cedar in direct contact with concrete. So before putting the post in the ground, I first treated the bottoms of each post with a protecting agent called copper naphthenite. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Naphthenite. It's funny that different regions here, different regions pronounce things differently, uh, pronounce things differently. So we would call that copper naphthenate. Uh, copper naphthenate, yeah. To speed up this process, I grabbed a cardboard tube and lined it with a heavy duty trash bag, then used a simple strap to secure it at an angle to the bandsaw mill's bed. Simple straps are stretchy and can conform to any tying pattern. It's just a few quick wraps, tuck the end into itself, and then I was ready to go. I poured two gallons into the tube and then grabbed the first post and set it in gently, just making sure the corner wouldn't tear open the liner. You can see when I pull it out that about three feet of the post is covered. If you can tolerate the shoulder workout, I definitely think a dipping method is better than brushing or rolling on the liquid. But that's another great thing about Western Red Cedar. It is extremely light. So this is a good idea to coat the posts before they go in just to add a barrier of protection between the posts and the concrete and the posts and any moisture that's in the ground. Uh, there's actually specific products made for this type of application. Uh, the post saver product comes to mind. It's a sleeve that goes on the post uh, that once it's heat treated, it prevents moisture and rot. Uh, might might be a little bit more straightforward than, than trying to dip all these posts, but uh, one way or the other, putting a barrier in there is always a good idea. So while it was a shoulder workout, it really wasn't all that bad. After dipping a post, I would set it aside and let it dry, then move on to the next. Okay, let's actually start setting the post. One of the most important things to set up with a fence or anything you want straight is a string line. This runs from the very end point of the fence to the start. And this is set one inches forward from where the post fronts needs to end up. So that's something that we've talked about in other videos is when you're, when you are using a string line, use an offset string line. So in her case, she went a few inches. Typically we would go somewhere like six inches to a foot, depending on terrain, uh, so that the string line can always stay up. You don't have to take it down when you're installing your post. And, uh, and you don't end up bumping that string over time. A lot of times you see people set a string line and then butt the object directly against it. However, with that, you run the risk of slightly bumping and altering the string line as you work down the line. By having an offset, you completely cut out that chance. When we were positioning it, we would set the face off of the string line by one inch exactly. And I'll go ahead and tell you now that this fence came out extremely straight. Another key point to focus on with this style of fence is that the posts turn out to be exactly six feet on center. With a vertical fence, the posts matter, but aren't as critical because the rails can be cut to the needed length. But with a horizontal fence, the length of picket determines where the posts are. We pulled a tape on each and every hole before setting the post to make sure it was drilled in the correct location, and plenty of them weren't, so be sure to check. 
We had to chisel out so many of these holes with a rock bar and shovel to get the post to not only land on the needed distance between, but also the one inch off the string line. Once the position of the hole was good, then we actually started setting the post. First dumping in some river rocks to create a standoff off the bottom and keep the post from being in direct contact with the ground. So that's something you hear a lot in, uh, in regions that have more clay in the soil that might hold more water in the soil is putting gravel at the bottom of the hole. Um, it's not something, not something we do, but if you're in an area that has high clay content, it's not going to let that water drain very easily. Putting gravel at the hole at the bottom of the hole could help with that. The idea here is moisture will pull at the bottom of these holes, but the gravel will prevent the post from sitting in it and therefore being damaged from it. Next, the post goes in and then gets stabilized with two two by fours. The first thing when the post goes in is to get the sitting position correctly. This is where we'll make sure it's not only six feet from the previous post, but also one inch from the string line. And then we would set the braces. For one of the braces, we actually used the previous post instead of driving in a stake. This is held into place at the bottom with a screw and also gave us a way to square up the post to the previous post. After Jake secured the bottom, we would use a clamp to hold it in rough position. Next, I would grab the second brace, eyeball where it would land on the adjacent face and drove a stake into the ground to secure this other end. That's an interesting bracing method. I haven't I haven't seen that bracing method used before, but now that you sit and look at it and hear it explained, it makes a lot of sense. While I was doing that, you could see Jake using a second clamp to hold the top up. Now that it was roughed in, we did all of the fine tuning, and this entailed using a level on two adjacent faces to plumb it up. We would loosen one clamp at a time and reset it when the post was plumb in that direction. After being reset, one of us would come back with a screw to hold it more securely while we moved on to repeat the process with the next one. Setting the post actually goes very quickly once the hole locations are correct. If you have good ground or even just a good auger operator, then the process should be a breeze. It took us two days instead of one to set all of the posts because we were having to finesse so many of these by hand. After they were all set up though, next it was time to set them in concrete. And this is a pretty straightforward process. Each post took roughly two bags, sometimes a bit more, and with this many posts, I definitely recommend either buying or renting a concrete mixer. And this way you can pour the bags in, add water from a hose, and then let it take some work off your plate. So depending on how many holes you have to drill, or have to set rather, on a, on a project like this where you could get a larger truck in, in there fairly easily, you could also uh, purchase you know, delivered concrete. Depending on how many holes you have, I almost think that she probably, depends on the minimum load that, that your concrete provider requires, but I'd almost think with this many holes, taking that much concrete per hole, she might have saved herself a little bit of time uh, just contracting out the concrete delivery. Sometimes it was difficult to get the mixer close enough to pour into the hole without bumping into the post itself. And a tip for this is you can use a shovel to catch and direct the concrete as somebody else pours it. Then, of course, you can just scoop out the last bit by hand if needed. You can either tilt the mixer and drag it out or use a shovel in the traditional way and dump it in. It's best to pour in enough concrete to mound up slightly past the surface of the ground. Then the idea is to sculpt it so that the water will want to shed away from the post itself and not pull around it. To do this, I actually used a putty knife to build it up at the base of the post and then sloped it down and smoothed it out. After repeating on every single post and letting it sit overnight, that was one of the major steps down, which of course is always a great feeling. Now at this point, the posts are just left long or tall. So the next step is to cut them all to the wanted height. It's at this point you can determine how tall you want your fence and make them all that measurement. I personally live in the county and don't have any regulations on height, so I let the shortest post of mine determine the height, which came out to be eight feet. Since I have a transit, which is a laser level system, I used it to make a level mark on every single post. It doesn't matter where this mark is, as long as it's the exact same on each and every one. If you aren't familiar with the transit, a laser is set on a tripod and projects out a laser in a level line. Then you use a handheld receiver that picks up the laser and indicates if you need to move up or down to be in line. After all of the posts are marked, now a story stick, which is just a jig essentially, can be made and clamped in position to indicate where all the different cuts and marks are needed. That's very interesting. You know, I, I've seen levels set a lot of different ways, uh, but with her system, I think that makes a lot of sense. If, if you're building fences as a profession, I can see that making sense. On DIY crowd, you might see if they have 
you know, a piece of hardware like that available for rent. Uh, I see that I could def- absolutely see the justification for it, uh, especially if you're a professional fence builder. Makes a lot of sense. See, every post will need to be cut to length, but every post will also need a top and bottom rail. So all of these things can be marked at the same time to not only make the process quick, but also accurate. I would line up my story stick to the transit mark on each post, then use a pencil to mark my top and bottom marks. Next, I started by cutting all of the posts to the same height. And this is done with a circular saw and two cuts on two opposite faces. After getting the post to height, I cut out a notch on the top of every other post, which the reason why won't make a lot of sense now, but it will in the next step. It was again, two cuts with the circular saw to make this cut. The first one was a plain horizontal cut across the face. Then the second cut was a vertical cut along the top end grain. And don't be alarmed if your blade starts smoking some. Just take your time on the cut because it's really hard grain to cut through. I needed a bit more depth on this cut after going all the way across the post. So I used a Sawzall to finish off the cut on each side. The posts are almost done being prepped at this point, but there's one more thing needed before the rails can go in and that's hardware. To have a really clean, nice face, the rails need to be mounted to the inside of the post. So next, Jake went to each and every one and used a nail gun to attach the hanging hardware. These rely on the bottom most mark from the story stick, then are lined up flush to the front face of the post. While he was doing that, I was getting the measurements for each rail. You can most certainly just pull a tape, but I recently discovered the glories of a laser tape measure, where all I had to do is hold it butted up against the start of what I want to measure and point it to the end. So in this case, the hardware bracket, and boom, it gives me the exact readout on what my measurement is. The rails are two by fours, again, sticking with Western red cedar here, and cut down to the length so that they fit in the hardware placed on the inside of the post. Since the posts are six feet on center, these turn out to be a little less than six feet each. So just a tip, instead of buying eight footers and having two feet of wasted material on each board, I bought 12 footers and got two rails from one board, just ending up with a few inches of wasted material on each. So that's a great tip. You know, reducing the amount of waste material is always a good idea, but especially currently when we're in the middle of a wood shortage, the price of this lumber has skyrocketed. So any material you can save from being wasted is essentially money in your pocket. After I cut all of the bottom rails, it was a simple matter of slipping them right into place. Then I repeated by moving to the top. However, instead of going from the inside to the inside of each post, the top actually spans two bays and ties three posts together, which will help with rigidity and also keep things straight. And this is the reason for the notch in the top of every other post. I like that a lot. So a lot of times when you're talking to fence guys, some fence guys will nail section to section. So in this case, you know, six foot at a time uh, between each two by four is only six feet. And then other guys will say, well, we'll skip, we'll do the skipping method, which so you'll use 12 foot, right? And you'll offset those, the overlaps. So she's actually using kind of both, method, both methods uh, for the best of both worlds to get the strength and stability, but also ease. It allows the 12 foot rail to go from the inside of one post, pass through the second, and then attach to the inside of the third. This slips into the hanging hardware just as easily as the bottoms. So I first cut and then placed every board in their needed location then came back and did all of the attaching. For the hanging hardware, I used a palm nailer to very quickly drive the nails in their holes. Then I used a nailer to secure the top stringer in the notch of the center post. Okay, one last step and then the substructure of the fence will be complete. The pickets will be horizontal and running from one post to the other, but that leaves a little less than six foot span in between. To give it rigidity, we next added in a center vertical support member. This will give the picket a third member to attach to when they start getting added. Again, you can definitely use a regular tape on each section to get a measurement, but I use my laser tape again to make quick work of it. I first found center on each bay, then directed my laser straight up. Once I had all my measurements, I made the cuts, then attached each board into place with a few nails. You can see I'm using a spacer there on the right to make sure the top and bottom are the same distance away from the post.
In my opinion, that is not bad for four days, especially with such rocky terrain. Now keep in mind that if you have a fence on your to-do list, it, it's not gonna be this difficult if you don't have rocky terrain and if your post holes are dug in the correct location by whoever you hire that job out to. And I definitely do think it's worth hiring out the post hole digging itself. Stay tuned for part two where I show you the next steps, which is gonna include picketing, top cap, trim, and then finishing out the ground area. Well, guys, I think the first part of this turned out really well. I'm very excited to see part two. If you have questions or comments about this, about part one of this video, be sure to leave them in the comments below. Until next time, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors.